immer bleibt die erste Reihe frei. Alle, die jetzt da hinten stehen, hier sind noch vier, sechs freie Plätze in der ersten Reihe. Wollt ihr nicht? Nein? Okay. So, also sind wir wieder zusammen. Das ist die neunte Out the Box. Äh, herzlich willkommen, schön, dass ihr da seid. Äh, es ist zum ersten Mal im Hafen, ist auch für uns Premiere. Ähm, ich, und ich kann mich hören im Livestream, das ist ja großartig. Irritiert fast gar nicht. Okay, das muss so. Ähm, ich bin Hardy, neben mir steht Glenn. Ähm, wir zwei organisieren Out the Box zusammen mit einem ganz, ganz großen Team. Und äh, bei dem möchte ich mich jetzt auch bedanken. Als erstes natürlich dem Hafenteam. Ähm, wir haben hier seit heute Morgen und eigentlich auch die letzten Wochen äh, ziemlich viel gearbeitet, um das auf die Beine zu stellen. Ähm, Darum möchte ich mich bedanken bei dem Hafenteam, äh, großartig, wie wir da zusammengearbeitet haben wieder. Viele, viele Leute sind daran beteiligt. Ähm, beim Sören möchte ich mich bedanken, der sitzt da und sorgt für den Livestream. Ich höre mich nicht mehr, vielen Dank Sören, super gemacht. Ähm, ähm, wir werden heute gefilmt. Okay. <lacht> Über drei Kameras. Ähm, vielleicht entdeckt er ja die eine oder andere. Äh, eine habt ihr schon entdeckt, die ist über uns. Ähm, die wird euch nachher helfen, die Veranstaltung zu verfolgen. Ähm, wir möchten uns bedanken bei Studio Accord, die dieses großartige Plakat gedruckt haben, was Patrick Thomas gestaltet hat. Äh, das Plakat darf jeder mitnehmen heute, der heute hier sitzt. Ähm, die meisten kennen das auch schon. Es wird dann hangsigniert nach der Veranstaltung an der Bar. Ähm, jedem steht eins zu. Ich möchte mich bei Arif und Jan Keno bedanken. Vielen Dank, dass ihr uns euer Projektoren zur Verfügung gestellt habt. <lacht> ähm, bei Jonathan, der die entsprechenden Animationen äh, bereitgestellt hat, nicht diese, aber die zwei da hinten, ähm, die sind entstanden aus einem, einem äh, Promotion-Film für Out the Box. Da haben wir Loops rausgemacht. Ähm, bei Glenn möchte ich mich bedanken, denn neben mir steht nicht nur als Organisator, sondern ähm, auch, weil er Form 55 als Blog betreut und Mitgründer ist und über die letzten Wochen extrem viel Promotion für Out the Box gemacht hat. Vielen, vielen Dank, Glenn. Ähm, bei Hannes und Matthias, äh, bei, mit den beiden habe ich über zwei Tage diese Bemalung da an den Fenstern gemacht, ähm, im Design von, von Patrick Thomas, also nach Vorlage. Ähm, bei Sascha, der hier neben mir steht jetzt und Fotos macht heute Abend, vielen Dank dafür. Bei Völkel und Fritz Kohler, äh, die uns ein bisschen sponsoren mit Getränken und ein bisschen Kleingeld. Ähm, bei Felix und Florian, die später hier auflegen werden. Ähm, ihr wisst, dass ihr mit eurer Karte alle berechtigt seid, zur Party zu bleiben ab 11. Also wir würden gerne mit euch noch länger feiern. Ähm, bei Paolo, der das möglich macht von FH1, und zwar weil er die Anlage zur Verfügung stellt. Ähm, wichtig bei einer Party und ähm, bei euch allen, die heute hier sind, ähm, ich glaube, wir haben 80 verkaufte Karten. Das ist ähm, ziemlich gut für Out the Box. Das äh, freut uns sehr, dass nach wie vor die Nachfrage da ist und dass wir das weitermachen können. Ähm, und wir möchten uns bedanken bei Patrick Thomas, ähm, nicht zuletzt, der da draußen schon Stehl und Kreise zieht und äh, ex <lacht> sehr nervös ist, <lacht> glaube ich. Ähm, wer Patrick Thomas genau ist, wird Glenn gleich nochmal erzählen. Ich möchte erstmal noch auf Out the Box eingehen. Es gibt ein paar. Wer ist zum ersten Mal bei Out the Box? Oh. Okay, dann rede ich jetzt ein bisschen langsamer. <lacht> ähm, wow. Super. Ähm, also, Out the Box, wie ist das eigentlich entstanden? Ähm, wir waren auch mal Studenten und als wir Studenten waren, haben wir festgestellt, dass äh, die Leute, die wir eigentlich reden hören wollen, nicht in Hannover Halt machen, sondern eigentlich nur auf Durchfahrt sind. Und ähm, haben gesagt, dann machen wir es halt eben selber. Und zwar nicht in dem Format, was wir halt uns ja, so gewohnt sind. Leute stehen auf der Bühne, zeigen ihr Portfolio, ähm, klicken durch und zeigen eigentlich genau das, was wir aus dem Internet auch schon kennen. Und äh, lernen eigentlich nichts über den Menschen selber oder die Person oder die Kreativität dahinter. Und werden vor allem nicht inspiriert. Also wir zahlen eine Menge Geld. Beispiel einige große Veranstaltungen, 3, 4, 5, 600 Euro, würde ich gerne, kann ich nicht. Und dann haben wir gesagt, es muss auch anders gehen und haben dann Out the Box entwickelt äh, mit der Idee, dass man sich nicht darauf vorbereiten kann. Also Patrick Thomas kommt hier hin und weiß eigentlich nicht, was passieren wird. Genauso wie ihr, genauso wie wir. Ähm, darum stellen wir da eine Box hin und in dieser Box sind Dinge. Ähm, ein paar von euch haben Dinge mitgebracht, genauso soll es sein. Also diese Box wird dann geöffnet 
da sind eine Menge Sachen drin, die auch Patrick definitiv noch nicht gesehen hat. Und diese Dinge sind Gesprächsgrundlage heute Abend. Äh, was er damit macht, ist ganz klar seine Entscheidung. Ähm, es ist wichtig, dass nur damit gearbeitet wird. Er darf nicht sein Portfolio zeigen oder äh, solche Sachen. Ähm, er darf sie verändern, zerstören, bemalen, kombinieren oder Anekdoten dazu erzählen oder auch von dort zum Thema, zum Thema, zum Thema zu kommen. Das ist auch in Ordnung. Ähm, so haben wir auf jeden Fall Improvisation und Inspiration, weil wir da merken, was eigentlich mit diesem Menschen passiert, der dann vor euch sitzt, ganz nah, ganz intim. Es ist ähm, keine große Bühne, kein blendendes Licht. Wir haben einen sehr, sehr direkten Austausch hier. Und ähm, genau das macht dieses Event aus. Es wird, ich hoffe, auch heute wieder diese Momente geben, wo hoffentlich auch ihm mal Dinge nicht einfallen zu einem Objekt. Und das äh, macht etwas, so eine, du hast es mal Energie genannt und diese Energie finde ich immer sehr, sehr aufregend. Ich hole mal kurz Luft. Ähm, dann äh, hat Patrick eine Hilfestellung und da, wo Sascha jetzt sitzt, wird heute Abend noch ein Praktikant sitzen. Ein Praktikant, der aus euren Reihen kommt. Äh, Patrick darf sich das aussuchen, ähm, wen er da auf die Bühne nimmt. Manche machen, das darf, darf er auch entscheiden, nach welchen Kriterien er da entscheidet. Ähm, mit dem, äh, der, der Praktikant hat dort einen Rechner und einen Drucker und das Internet und die entsprechenden Programme, um auch gestalten zu können. Ähm, Genau, ist dann sozusagen der Spielball, den er da zur Verfügung hat. Dann wird es eine Pause geben in der Mitte. Da werden wir alle trinken, rauchen und lachen. Und ähm, diese Kamera bleibt live. Und zwar die hier wird durchgehend gefilmt. Und wir werden diesen Tisch hier nutzen als Werbefläche. Also ihr dürft in 20 Minuten dann euch selber präsentieren. Hier sind Blätter, hier sind Stifte. Ihr, ihr dürft auch mal reingucken und ähm, winken oder eure Familie grüßen oder what, whatever. Ähm, Form 55 hat derzeit wie viele Follower? Ähm, auf Facebook ja. bei 12.500. Okay, 12.500 könnten es live sehen. Wir werden das danach auch noch online schalten. Ähm, vielleicht der ein oder andere Illustrator, Grafiker, Kalligraf, Künstler, der sich hier mal präsentieren möchte. Ähm, und dann haben wir natürlich die Poster, habe ich schon angesprochen, geht es am Ende. Und das alles ist eigentlich auch schon out the box. Und Glenn wird jetzt nochmal äh, den Ablauf auf Englisch wiederholen, weil wir ja auch englische Zus Zuschauer haben und äh, wird noch ein bisschen was über Patrick erzählen und ich wünsche euch auf jeden Fall ganz, ganz, ganz viel Spaß heute. Ähm, ich wünsche mir und uns auch viel Spaß und ja, out the box, willkommen. <lacht> Vielen Dank, Hardy. Ich, ich sage es kurz auf Deutsch, warum ich es jetzt auf Englisch mache, weil wir den Rest des Abends, äh, Patrick wird den, seinen Vortrag auf Englisch machen und da wir auch live streamen, dachten wir, es ist fair, dass ich auch das Intro dann auf Englisch mache. So we'll get started. As we found out, we have a lot of people here tonight that have never been to Out the Box, so it's uh, worthwhile actually explaining how it works for our audience online as well. So basically, our speaker tonight is Patrick Thomas, and he's going to come in and talk about the things that are in this box. The reason why we came up with this concept is we're a little bit tired of having to go and spend a lot of money to see speakers just show their work that you'll see where everywhere. And we wanted to find out a little bit more about them and about their personality. And by giving them a platform where they can't prepare at all, It means that it creates a really, uh, a, a really great energy because we can't predict what's going to happen here tonight and neither can Patrick and nobody knows what is going to happen here. So the box is filled with loads of interesting items that some of the guests have brought and some of us have filled the box with. And he has this area in front of us that you can see from up above Uh, to play around with, so he can arrange the things that come out of the box uh, in front of him. And each item will hopefully lead to an interesting story or an idea or an anecdote. You, uh, I guess we will find out what will come out of it. Um, he has an assistant that he gets to choose from the audience. One of you lucky people will be sitting at his side here and has You'll have a computer and a printer to work with and help him. If he gets stuck and he needs to Google something, then hopefully that will be your job as well. And we will have a short break in between just to kind of give you a break and get a drink. 
And during that time, we're going to keep the camera running, and you'll be able to use this space to, I don't want to say advertise, because Facebook doesn't allow advertising. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just say you can write some nice messages to our audience. So maybe you've got a cool idea uh, on how to use the space that's in the 20-minute break that we'll have later on. Uh, at the end, you'll all be getting one of the amazing posters that we've uh, that uh, Patrick has designed, and he'll hand sign them at the end if you've got the patience to wait in line. And that, I think, concludes what is going to happen this evening. Advertise, uh, wait. <laughs> oh, I see, I see what you did there. All right, so um, yeah, tonight I'd like to introduce to you Patrick Thomas. He's an international graphic artist, I think he classed himself as. And when I asked him to send me like a short intro ab about himself, he, uh, <laughs> he wrote that he was born the year before England beat Germany in the World <laughs> Cup, which I don't think is a great start. <laughs> uh, he studied uh, at Central St. Martins and the Royal College of Art in London. He studied art there. Uh, he's lived and worked in Barcelona for many years where he set up the multidisciplinary studio La Vista. In 2008, he's established his first screen printing uh, press and has exhibited across the globe and has printed more than 200 editions of his work. Um, he is currently, since 2013, professor at the uh, of Kommunikationsdesign at the Staatliche Akademie der Bildenden Künste Stuttgart. Sounds better in German than it does in English, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, and he now lives between Berlin, Barcelona, and London. But tonight, for the first time in Hafen, he is in Hanover. I'd like to introduce to you Patrick Thomas. Big round of applause, please. These are my notes. These are my notes. Können Sie mich hören? Auf Deutsch. Ich muss Deutsch üben. Okay. Um, ich bin sehr glücklich, uh, in Hannover zu sein. Guten Abend. That's about it. Okay. Um, I might suddenly start speaking in Spanish. I get very confused because I live in lots of different places. So. Uh, if I suddenly start speaking Spanish, uh, Ricardo, <laughs> remind me where we are. There you are. Yeah. Um, before I start, I'd like to um, thank, obviously, uh, Hardy for the invitation and Glenn for all of the hard work promoting it um, and obviously the, uh, the Hafen team. I'm incredibly impressed with the setup. Uh, you're, you're very, very lucky. <clears throat> The city of Hanover should be proud of you. I only wish you were in Berlin, because I, I would love to be able to use these incredible facilities uh, that you have here. Um, what else can I say? I haven't got any notes. I don't normally do this kind of thing. <laughs> I don't think anybody does. Um, again, I'd like to congratulate um, uh, Hardy and the team for this very original format. Um, I completely uh, agree that everybody is thoroughly bored of portfolio presentations and things like that. When, normally when I talk about my work, I kind of do stuff like this just to really confuse people. Um, but this idea to... I've no idea. I'm not kidding. I've no idea what's in here. I'm slightly terrified. I hope there are no live animals or anything. Um, and I don't really know how it's going to work. So... Um, I'm new to this. Some of you have seen it before. You know, you've got a, I follow in the steps of a very illustrious group of past guests. Eike Koenig, who I was with last week in Offenbach, and I was saying, Eike, what's in the bloody box? What's in the box? <laughs> and he's like, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine, don't worry. I said, like, come on, tell me one thing, at least. And, um, obviously, Peter Ziska, um, Andreas Uble trapped in suburbia. You've had some great guests. So I hope that I can maintain the level here. I mean, you know, there's a bit of pressure. And also because we're live streaming to the world makes it even easier for me. <laughs> um, 
the pressure's on. The pressure's on. At some stage, somebody, I'm going to pick a victim from the audience who, who can be my uh, co-pilot or my intern or my hiwi or something. So um, if I start getting lost, I'll suddenly grab somebody. All right? Um, I guess I'd better start. I mean, I'm, I'm like really curious to see how much trouble I'm in, basically. <laughs> How, so the, my first question is, how does the box open? Oh, OK, a lid from the back, without looking. Ooh, good Lord, a lot of things in there. OK, wish me luck. OK. Ah. Here we go. Can you see that? I have absolutely no idea what this is. Well, let's, try, let's turn it on. See if it can, yeah? I can really relate to this, actually. Um, so I'm kind of guessing that he's some kind of a Buddha with a, a headset. Um, I don't know very much about Buddhas that wear headsets, if I'm being completely honest. So I'm going to talk about his hair, because we have a very similar... <laughs> um, we go to the same barber shop, I think. Um, what can I say about hair? I regret saying that. I wear a hat, because, uh, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, so, um, right. Um, Hiwi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about, Hardy said that I can, I have to stick to the rules, but at the same time, I can sort of bend them very, very slightly, so I can find quite sort of tenuous links. Um, in this case, I'm going to talk about the colour, colour red, okay? This is very lucky, actually, that I picked this, because this is obviously Pantone 485, which is the only red, the best red. Um, and it takes me back to Liverpool, actually. Um, as you know, Klopp, we stole him. Yeah? Uh, he's become this national hero uh, in the UK. The colour of um, Liverpool football team, as, I, as I'm sure and I hope you all know, is, is red. Um, and you will see, if you look at my work, that red figures very, very prominently. Um, and red is a very interesting colour. Because in different cultures, it means different things. So for Europeans, it means sort of danger or stop. Um, for me, it means Liverpool. But for example, in, in India, it means, um, what does it mean, Hardy? I think it means love. So it's quite interesting how, how colors in different, you know, for different cultures mean very different things. Um, obviously, we get our, the warning codes from red come from, as I'm sure you're all very aware, come from, Things like fire and red berries, poisonous berries, because they don't have these things in, in India. It has different uh, significance. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on. <laughs> <coughs> God, I might have to start cheating a little bit. Shall oh, hang on, here we go. This is good. In fact, no, no, this is terrible because it's in centimetres. And I work in inches, as I'm sure you can imagine. So um, we'll forget that one immediately. The metric system was a complete disaster. You're all wrong. Um, not only do you drive on the wrong side of the road, uh, you use this really sort of completely illogical system to, to measure things. I don't know who managed to convince you to go metric. We finally had to, because the rest of the world you know, was kind of uh, applying a bit of pressure. <laughs> Inches are much better, because they're, they're kind of human. A meter, what is a meter? It's like, how does it relate to the human form, a meter? An inch is a thumb, it's the top section of a thumb. That is an inch. And a foot is a foot. <laughs> don't, don't ask me what a yard is. Uh, <laughs> And as for acres and things, and furlongs, and God knows what else. It's interesting because um, this will sound very, you know, slightly 
stupid, but the, the problems that it presents me with coming from the UK, I mean, obviously the driving thing is like, you know, it's like an kind of international joke, so, we, you know, we can live with that. Um, but things like paper sizes. I remember when I first moved to Barcelona, um, I had massive problems. I was painting canvases, and the, it was all my stretches, the wooden frames, the ramen, the holz ramen. <laughs> We're all in inches, yeah, 32 by 34 inches and things. And so I brought all of my canvases to Barcelona and I tried to get stretches and they didn't quite fit. They, they were all, you know, just slightly uh, off. So I should have brought one of these, really. I should have packed it and brought it with me uh, to Spain. I'm slightly getting, I'm getting used to, um, you know, the DIN system in Germany. It's okay. It's not too bad. It's not too bad. Um, it kind of makes work a bit easier, I suppose. Um, but the imperial system that comes from, I think, maybe 17th, 18th century France, actually, is what we work with, like paper sizes in the UK. Uh, that still dominates there. Um, yeah. You screwed up, yeah, with centimeters. But it's going to be OK. Let's keep going. Uh, ah. a box, a box inside a box. I need my glasses for this. Neither optical glass triangular prism, dimension in centimeters, <laughs> 30 by 30 by, oh, wow. Gosh, it's like a transparent Toblerone. That is absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, when I think of a prism, I think of a design group in, who worked in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s called Hy Hypnosis, who designed, amongst other things, the Pink Floyd cover, Dark Side of the Moon. Um, Yeah, that's, that's, that's all I can say about the prism, really. Um, it's so sort of ingrained in our subconscious, you know, mental subconscious that it's, um, w whenever I see a triangular foot glass form, it just brings me back to that, um, to that period and that album, yeah. If you don't know this album, get it, okay, Pink Floyd. And if you don't know hypnosis, that's H-I-P, G-N-O-S-I-S, -I or something. <laughs> they're, they're it's very, very, yeah. I've only had one beer. It's not because I'm, I, I can't pronounce things properly. Um, you might want to uh, check them out. They did brilliant work. Basically, they did, there was a guy, I think the main guy's name was Storm, who has, again, has a completely unpronounceable surname. Oh, Thorgerson. Thorgerson. Thank you, Glenn. Um, Google, you know, you should Google him. You should know about this, uh, the, uh, this, this design studio or this sort of do design collective. Um, there was, it was a sort of very flexible group and they'd just sort of pull in and make teams uh, depending on, the, on the, um, uh, the projects that they're working on. Apart from Pink Floyd, they worked a lot for um, Led Zeppelin. Um, but the most famous, the sort of most famous iconic covers are probably the, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the Pink Floyd covers. There's a very famous shot, I forget the album, but it's, um, they, they made um, an inflatable pig, yeah? Ein, ein Schwein, ein, ein, ein Luft, Luft, Luftballon Schwein. <laughs> and they flew it, they somehow, I mean, they made this it's a huge thing, it must have cost an absolute fortune. And they, um, they, they, they somehow floated it over Battersea Power Station in London. And um, I forget who I saw. Somebody was giving a talk about, about this. And, 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 you know, the way that things used to be before Photoshop and things like that. Like, in, in those days, these days, it'd be, like, dead easy. You'd just sort of superimpose it. You'd just, like, cut out a, a floating pig and, like, stick it on a photo and it takes 10 minutes. Back in the day, 
it probably took, you know, six months to make the bloody thing, to convince the group to pay for it, to get the planning permission from the London City Council to float it over, you know, close down airspace above the, 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 the Battersea Power Station. Um, but it is so great because they really did it. They didn't fake it. And you can tell it's a real thing. It's like a performance. It's performance art, basically. It's conceptual art. It's not a quick, you know, Photoshop fix. That's enough about the prism, I think. How many have I done? Three. Oh, my God. I've only got 197 to go. So. Um, oh. Okay. Paul von Ostalayen or somebody or other. Dag Stuhl Teffel. Nice hat. Yeah? <laughs> um, does anybody know who Paul van Ostein was? Should I read this to you? Yeah. That, that will take up the two hours, which, which would be a sort of take, take, take me a big favour. Okay. It's right, here we go. I hope you're sitting comfortably. <laughs> if this one's still working, ah, okay, yeah. cool. No. Are we in there? Okay, page number one. Oh, it's not German. Oh my God, it's, it's Dutch. <laughs> Crikey. No, I might just flick through it very, very quickly. Um, oh, Zeppelin. There you go. It's a nice connection to Led Zeppelin I was talking about a minute ago. Um, I guess this is... The layout is absolutely stunning. I guess it's in the tradition of, you know, the Dadaist sort of... Um, visual poetry, I guess it's called. Um, I know nothing about this guy, only that he wears nice hats. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, and I've no idea when he, oh, hang on, 1927. Right, so, yeah, contemporary with the, the Dadaists. I, I guess everyone knows the Dada poetry, this kind of nonsense stuff that they kind of stuck together. Um, yeah. Is, anybody, is there anybody Dutch in the room who can uh, help me with a bit of translating here? No, okay. Um, well, in that case, we have to appreciate it, you know, for, on purely visual grounds. Um, right. Some of the pages are more spectacular than other pages, I'm finding. <laughs> I want to find out more about this guy, having never heard about him. I will need an in I'll leave, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll leave this here on, on the side. I'll come back to it with an intern. I, I need a very smart intern who can help me to uh, decipher what the hell's going on there. And we'll move on to the next object. Uh, ooh. Do you remember these things? Snoop Doggy Dog. <laughs> One of my favourite art. No, really, seriously. Buster. I guess Buster is Buster Rhymes. <laughs> Kellis Ludacris. I've no idea. Missy, Missy and Snoop Dogg. Um, well, yeah, somebody was asking me about music, so I can talk about music now. Let's permit it. I don't know too much about Snoop Dogg. Doggy Dogg. <laughs> um, Somebody was asking me, and I get asked a lot, you know, when I'm working, if I, the kind of music I listen to, do I like music? I do like music. Um, as I'm from Liverpool, you have to like music, basically. Uh, when I was a teenager there, I was, um, basically everybody had, you have to be in a band. If you're a guy in the 80s in Liverpool, if you're not in a band, you're nobody, okay? <laughs> So you just get into any band. It doesn't matter if you can't play. That, 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 that's, not the, that's not the point. Just get into a band. Um, and before I embarked on my art slash design career, um, I entertained the, uh, you know, the fantasy of becoming a, a pop star. It didn't last very long. Uh, fortunately, my, my fellow members from the band uh, told me quite early on that, that I, I should maybe dedicate my time to something else. Um, however... In the brief time I was in my band in Liverpool, 
Um, amongst other things, we did a concert. No, we did a, um, a festival. So this is 1983 or 1984. Um, there was like a big, the big park in Liverpool, Sefton Park. Um, every summer there was a three-day festival. And there's like a huge, I remember, we, we, I don't know how we got um, onto the program. We were the very, very first band to play, okay? So our name was like that big. Um, and I remember we played on the, fr on the Friday as they were still setting up. And there was nobody, fortunately, there was nobody in the audience. Um, and we started to play and it was kind of terrible. There's like a guy sort of brushing up. <laughs> and we're like, we're like, where is everyone? You know, this is our moment of... <laughs> and... Um, the reason I'm telling you is because there was another band that played on the... Uh, so they were like... They weren't the very top band. I don't know the very top band. There was, a, there was another band uh, that played on the second day. And they'd just come back from London from recording an album. And they were kind of famous um, in Liverpool, locally. Nobody knew them outside of Liverpool. But they, they, they had this very char uh, charismatic singer called Holly a guy called Holly Johnson. Um, and it turned out the band was called... F no, I, actually, I'll tell you a little bit more uh, first. Holly... So we're all backstage at, the, at this festival, and everyone's, like, looking at us, going, oh, God, yeah, you're the, you're the first band, you were terrible, you know, you shouldn't really be here, sort of thing. And we're like, yeah, but, you know... <laughs> we, <laughs> um, and I remember that this band came... So we went back the next day. We had our, par our free passes. We went back the next day. And I remember this band arrived. And they were saying, yeah, we've just been in, in London in a Liverpool accent. We've just been in London making a really good record. Like, you know. And we're all like, yeah, Holly, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know. Um, and sure enough, six months later, their record came out. And that band was called Frankie Goes to Hollywood. I don't know if, well, if some of you from the reaction have probably heard of them. Um, and then relax and you know, things like that that happened soon after that. Um, yeah. How did I start? Oh, yeah, Snoop. Snoop Dogg, yeah. <laughs> the magic of music. What was the name of your band? I can't tell you. Oh. It had... <laughs> it was a bit unfortunate because at the time in Liverpool, your band have, had to consist of at least three or four different words. It couldn't just be called, you know, The, the Clash or the jam, or a cool name like that. It has to be like, you know, a really long, stupid name. Um, and that's what I'm not going to tell you, I'm afraid. Maybe later on, after a few more beers, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal that information. Um, I was going to talk about music. Um, very important to me. Um, having realized that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to cut it as a, as a, as a, as a rock star. Um, it was important because, like many designers of my generation, um, and you will have heard it, it's become a you know, bit of a cliche for people to talk about this, but a lot of us got into designing through the music packaging. Um, in Liverpool, there was a very sort of healthy club, club scene. We had the Hacienda nightclub um, just down the road in Manchester, and we'd kind of hang out there. Um, the Hacienda, who's heard of the Hacienda? Have you, yeah? Factory Records, Joy Division, or New Order, all, all of that. I'd love to show you a photograph of the Hacienda, because it's, it's, it still looks incredible today. Um, an intern. OK, so that's another like, little Alfgarber for, for the intern when they come. You have to imagine that before the Hacienda, clubs were usually underground in damp cellars. They were always painted black. This is in, Eng in northern England, yeah? They always smelt really bad. Um, they had carpets that were normally sticky because of all the beer. Um, and there was absolutely no glamour at all. It, it was just about, you know, the music. It's just like a sort of um, a cheap place to kind of, you know, see a bit of live music. And then the Hacienda came along and completely uh, revolutionised everything. And quite honestly, it was the first time that I became aware of design. Before that, I was convinced I was going to be an artist. I was taught by artists uh, on my foundation course, in the, on my basic year course in Liverpool. Um, so it was all about art. And then through music packaging and this one nightclub that looked like sort of European modernist design references came from nowhere, opened up, and it caused a complete revolution. And you can still see the, um, uh, the influence on 
more or less every kind of club space these days. That's 35 years ago. Right, thanks, Snoop. Sorry I didn't talk about you, but, you know, it was a... Let's keep going. I'm getting into it now. I'm, I'm warming up a bit, slightly. Um, crikey. Ooh, yeah, that's nice. Black and white. Um, this, for me, I'm very... I mean, some of you might have seen my work on, I guess, like Instagram and things like that. I, I, I'm quite interested, amongst a million other things, I'm, I'm very interested in kind of modular systems, uh, ways of kind of constructing things that sort of construct themselves that don't need too much sort of intervention. Um, and most of this actually stems from a two-minute, no, a six a six-week period that I spent in Sao Paulo um, two years ago. I remember I'd never been to Brazil before. I'd heard, you know, great things about, um, about Sao Paulo. I'd heard really bad things as well. So it's like really dangerous. It isn't. They're brilliant. The Brazilians are really lovely people. Um, but the, the thing that most impressed me when I, when I got out of my taxi in the center of Sao Paulo was this incredible graphic system that covers all of, the, all of the sidewalks, the pavements throughout the city. It's absolutely wonderful. And basically, they have... I need a piece of paper now, don't I? You don't have a black pen. I have to do it in blue. They have this system, which is... They have lots of different systems, but, but like the, the, ma the, ma the main system... I, the main system is that they have these tiles that are very, very simply designed like this in a triangle, yeah? Just like a black, half black, a bit yin-yang, yeah? Black and white. And with this by... By simply rotating... Um, each of the pieces, they can, they can build endless designs, repeating designs throughout the city. It's really, really smart. It only needs one component. But you can draw very, very different forms. Um, that got me interested. I spent most of my time there, apart from preparing an exhibition, walking around. I was living in, right in the center. Um, and I spent a lot of time walking around photographing these different perme uh, permeations, you know, these different sort of um, configurations that, that you can build using this system. And I started to make very simple little paintings, like little acrylic sketches and things. Um, my idea being that I wanted, I needed some sort of a system that would kind of design itself, so I wouldn't have to spend too much time worrying about composition and it would free me up to concentrate purely on, on color and color combinations. And it's a direct reflu uh, reference and inf influence to the German designer, Josef Albers. You know Josef Albers, yeah? one of the great color colorists of the 20th century. Very famous series, The Homage to the Square. And again, he had this very, very simple system. There were two or three variations, but essentially, he designed this system that would permit him to experiment purely with color without having to worry about the composition. Um, somewhere, it will come up on the, um, on the projection at some stage. Somewhere, I, I applied it to a job. I'm not going to start talking about my work. Don't, don't worry about that. But um, some, I posted some of these very simple paintings on Instagram. Um, and an agency in London picked up on it. And they said, what's all this about, these sort of very sort of geometric designs? What is it? And I said, well, I don't really know. It's just like experimentation, just playing around, uh, basically. Um, and they said, well, we've got a client. We'd like to use this for a, for a project that we're working on. So I said, OK, who is it? What's the client? And they said, well, we can't tell you. It's like a big client. It's like top secret. Um, but it turned out to be um, the Abbey Road recording studio, where the Beatles recorded. You know the Abbey Road? It's got, again, it's got a very iconic uh, cover of the four Beatles walking across a zebra crossing. 
in North London. Um, this, this is absolutely fantastic for me. It, as I say, it will come up at some stage, um, but it's now become part of their new identity. And the lovely thing, again, with things like social media is because Abbey Road is such a kind of photograph space, um, I get people sending me photographs of these funny little geometric designs that I was playing around with um, in Berlin, completely and utterly unrelated to Abbey Road. They send them to me. And, and I, at, at one stage, I said, well, it's not actually, it hasn't got anything to do with Abbey Road. It's more about Sao Paulo. And they're like, oh, don't worry about that. You know, don't tell anyone. It's, it, 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 kind of, it, it kind of works for us. Um, basically, what they wanted to do was, and this brings me back to this, they wanted to reference the, the zebra crossing, you know, the, the, the black and white stripy thing, but without making it so obvious, you know, not, not such a sort of direct parallel bar sort of connection. So they liked my, you have to imagine it's black and white, um, my, my sort of take on the whole thing. There you go, black and white. I like black and white. I, I actually published a book a few years ago um, called Black and White. Um, which is no longer available, but occasionally it pops up. Uh, yeah, that's black and white. Black and white's important. I'm, gonna, I'm looking for something really easy, but there, there isn't anything. Oh, hang on. Typo quiz. Now, because... I'm kind of known as an image maker. Pe people kind of assume I know nothing about typography. So this is my, my chance now to prove them all wrong. Let's see if I can identify. How does this work? Does anyone know? Oh, crikey. Right, typo quiz. So there's a free beer for whoever can get the, uh, the first answer. Wie nennt man Zahlzeichen mit Ober- und Unterlingen? A, medieval siphon. B, maus kel siphon. C, fesal siphon. Or D, tabellen siphon. A, B, C, or D? A, A. How do I find out? Is it, does it sound on the back? Isn't it? Okay, so, okay, so, hang on, hang on, hang on. A or B? It's A. The, the, you put this in the box, did you? The, this was your... Yeah. <laughs> and the answer is... Ah! Medieval Ziffen. Oder Minus Kelt Ziffen. This is going to be really confusing the international uh, audience. Yeah. Let's do another one. This is good fun. You get a beer. You get a free beer, yeah. Pa paid by Hardy. Let's have a look here. Let's have a look. Okay. Okay. This is a, okay. This is going to you know sort out the uh, the professionals from the amateurs. In welchem Jahr erschien die Rotis Schriftzipper? A. 1978. B. 1981. C. 1985 or the day 1988. A, B, C, D for a free beer, paid by Hardy. <laughs> if you get it wrong, you have to pay for the beer. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, think very carefully. Okay? Nobody, no? You have to pay for the beer. Okay. <laughs> you have to buy her a beer. There you go. <laughs> and who designed it? You've got, you, know, you must know this, all of you. Who designed Hotis? Very good. I'm sorry you don't get a beer. The, the beers have run out for this round, but. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Can I do that? It's probably strictly against the rules, isn't it? But... Right, okay, one more, one more. This, it doesn't mention English typography. I'm getting slightly offended here. Hang on. Uh, okay. Nothing English. Unbelievable. 
<laughs> Unbelievable. Right. Okay. Let's do a random one. Here we go. <clears throat> in welchem Jahrhundert is the Barock Antigua entstanden? A. 12 Jahrhundert, B. 14 Jahrhundert, C. 16 Jahrhundert oder D. 18 Jahrhundert? That's a difficult one. No? Yeah, very good, yeah. yeah. So another beer though. I'll pay for that last one because I, I'd probably run out of uh, credit. Well done. Okay, right, moving rapidly along. <clears throat> Crikey. Oh my word. Oh my word. <laughs> you wouldn't believe what's in there. You wouldn't believe what's in here. Uh, God. <laughs> okay. This is from the, the Hamburger, uh, sorry, the Hanover Messe, is it, or something? V visitors to win Hall 13, stand 542. Yeah? Um, one global. Bouncy tennis ball. Um, okay. Here we go. I'm not allowed to talk about color again. Actually, I will talk, talk about color again. This, there's, a, there's a color which um, I'm, I'm meant to be writing a new book. I've published two books. I'm, I'm meant to be writing a new book about colour. So I'm researching colours. And this looks quite like um, Indian yellow. Yeah, the colour Indian yellow. So I started to, amongst other things, you've got great story. You know, the, the, the colour names are absolutely fascinating. Ivory white. How do, have you said my ivory of Deutsch? Effen? Effenbein. Ivory is white, yeah? Why is it called ivory black? Makes no sense, no? It makes perfect sense because historically or traditionally, they would make um, ivory black the pigment through burning um, ivory, okay? When it burns, it makes this very, very dense, heavily pigmented, um, very, very dense, very black, black. Ivory black. This got me thinking, well, you know, I'll, I'll read into a few other um, color names. Amongst them, Indian yellow. Indian yellow, so why Indian yellow? So I, I looked up Indian yellow, and the story goes that in India, cows are sacred. You have to like the sacred cows. Um, however, when it comes to pigment production, the cows become less sacred for some reason, because to get this incredibly vivid, uh, very rich yellow that they put into Indian uh, yellow, they, they've stopped doing it now, you'll be pleased to hear, but they used to feed, they used to give the cows only mango leaves, mango, yeah? And the cows would like, you know, mango, 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 <laughs> mango, 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 and then after like two or three weeks, the cow's urine, the oh. urine, would have become incredibly intense. It's like incredibly tense, um, intense color that they would extract the pigment from and mix it up into, you know, oil bases and things and, and, make, uh, and make Indian yellow. How did I end up talking about sacred cows and that? Kind of made sense somehow, somewhere. I'm always wondering who tries those things first. Who tries? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a good point. Um, I don't know, but they probably made a lot of money out of it. No, okay. <laughs> no somebody probably saw it and yeah. copied it. Like, like, like they, okay. Moving rapidly along. Um, crikey. Oof. F. Oh, no, this is a bit cryptic, isn't it? F. Does anybody know what this is? Hardy, help me. I don't have to wear it or something, do I? No? Oh, here we go. Whenever I see silver, it's a bit like Pantone 485. With, with the red, I think of Liverpool. When I, when I see silver, I think of uh, Andy Warhol, the factory. 
where, as you know, they, he, he painted the... Um, no, they didn't paint it. They covered the, the walls of the, the studio in, um, in silver foil, baking foil. What on earth is going on here? Is it, an F? is it an F? Is it an F? Is it a... I have to inflate it. Is this a good idea? How do I find... Hang on, where is the... I need a straw. That's lucky. Um, now, where do I put the bloody straw? That's the next thing. Does anybody know how this works? You get a straw. This is what your interns really Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> you get a straw. And okay. You put it in there, and then you can... Can we have a straw, please? I think do it properly. There you go. Do I have to do it? Do you want to do it, Glenn? <laughs> yeah? There you go. While, while I talk... Uh, ab <laughs> I'll talk about Andy Warhol. Um, <laughs> it's good seeing someone else suffer for a bit. No? Um, getting back to Andy Warhol, I guess because I'm very interested in, um, you know, silkscreen Siebdruck, he's kind of the guy who made it, you know, put it on the map, who took it from being an industrial process and turned it into, quite cynically, into um, um, a fine art uh, process. Um, I was in London two or three weeks ago um, at a show at Tate Modern, a guy called, um, for me, the most important, I mean, with Picasso, I guess, but there was another artist who, who Warhol's up there, but there's another guy called Robert Rauschenberg. I don't know if you know about Robert Rauschenberg or not. He was a contemporary of Warhol. Um, and he experimented with uh, Siebdruck as well, with silkscreen. Basically, Rauschenberg's deal was, his philosophy was, um, yeah, yeah. Did he... This is going to take a long time. This is going to take the rest of the evening, quite honestly. <laughs> should we get the microphone on that as well, for, for added? I should have a sip of beer while, while uh, Glenn's doing that. You're getting there. You're getting there. It's, it's going to be all right. It'll, it'll be ready by Christmas, I think, if we're lucky. Um, Robert Ra so. It makes you feel quite Scottish, like. <laughs> 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 exactly. <laughs> Very good. The story goes that Robert Rauschenberg was visiting Andy Warhol's office one day, or studio, the factory. Uh, that's enough, yeah. Don't overdo it. Oh, well done, brilliant, yeah, fantastic. So we're kind of back to the floating pig again, aren't we? Really, like the, the Luftballon Schweiner. Um, Robert Rauschenberg was at Andy Warhol's um, studio at the factory, and he saw him playing around with this new technique, or this industrial technique, and he saw that he could use, he could also apply images onto canvas, and he then embarked on a, a very productive um, period, like decade-long period of printing, found images, appropriating images, taking images from the press, and building them into his own um, artwork. Um, this, this idea has been very um, influential on my practice, I suppose. It sort of questions authorship, um, Meant it lots of different things. Rauschenberg famously said, um, if you want to make work about the real world, use the real world. Okay, so he would use lots of found objects. Um, yeah, slightly diverging a little bit there. But um, there we go. A, a giant um, effer, bookstaber. Yeah, uh, okay. Where do I put this? Yeah, it, I might take it back to Berlin, actually. <laughs> And I'm going to keep going. 
Let's have a look. God, no, I can't do that. Oh, hang on, a bottle of gin. This could come in very handy. <laughs> Bombay Sapphire Gin. Much better than monkey gin, that stuff that you guys... Well, that's made in Schwarzwald. I'm, I'm safe in Hanover saying that, aren't I? Um, I don't, yeah, gin, for me, gin is about an English artist called William Hogarth. Has anybody heard about William Hogarth? He made this very, very famous, very important. He made it, basically, he made um, socio-political work, you know, he was one of the first guys, basically, to kind of address social issues uh, in his work. Um, he was a printmaker. I got into him, you know, via the, the kind of print thing. Um, but he was a very interesting guy. Um, not only was he a brilliant artist, he was a brilliant businessman. And um, he used to do things like... Um, he got into printmaking because he, he felt it his sort of obliga moral obligation, more or less, to sort of connect people with art. He wanted to make it as affordable as possible. This is something that I can completely relate to. It's one of the reasons why I got into um, making editions of my work. Um, and one of his most important pieces, and I'm sure this gentleman knows it, uh, um, is it actually it's a diptych, um, and it's called Gin Lane. They're two etchings, sort of, I was going to say din A3 size, but it's uh, in, in inches, so it's... Uh, 22 and a half inches by 17 inches. Um, and basically, there are two scenes of London. It is related directly to gin, by the way, in case you're wondering if I've, I've gone, off, uh, gone off on one. Um, and basically, one was called Gin, gin Alley, okay? Gin Strasser, if you like. And that was a very negative um, sort of cityscape. He drew this awful scene of like people who were addicted to gin. Alco alcoholism was rampant in Georgian England. Um, and he made this, this picture, like, almost like a poster, so, to sort of educate people uh, to the, you know, the, the dangers of, of alcohol. Basically, um, I think that some sort of legislation had been passed banning the production of, or the brewing of beer or something. Um, and people started to sort of illegally st distill gin or like a very sort of primitive form of gin and it was basically killing people okay at this stage i need a, an illustration of, of the piece just, just, if you're interested just uh, google gin gin alley and to complement it alongside the second part of the of the triptych is called beer street okay and beer street is the complete opposite it's a very healthy sort of optimistic view of london and basically what he's saying is that you know if you stick to beer you're going to be okay all right, beers for, you know, it's good English, uh, uh, warm beer, I'm afraid. Um, but if you stick to beer, you're going to be okay, whereas gin is going to kind of finish you off. So Bombay gin, go easy, yeah? Drink it a bit later. In part two, I, I should drink it, yeah. Right. Ooh. No, not that. Oh, dear. Crikey. Whew. A boot lace. A boot lace. Oh, dear. What can we say about a boot lace? Purple. I can't talk... I'm talking a lot about colour, aren't I? I don't know too much about training shoes. Adidas. Should we talk about Adidas and Puma? The, the trainer wars. No. Okay. Should I talk about Prince? The print Purple Rain, yeah? I oh, know that's back to Keller again, oh God. Um, no, it's gotta be about Prince. Last year, was it last year? It was absolutely, as you all know, it's an absolutely terrible year. And I made, I made quite a lot of work about it, actually. Um, it was the year that, you know, Bowie, Bowie Prince, um, the fifth Beatle, uh, George Martin, the, the, the producer of the Beatles uh, music, they all died. George Michael died. It was absolutely horrendous. Lemmy from Motorhead died. I mean, what, what happened? It was a tragic year. Um, I guess there are a few students in the room. 
When I was your age, in that case, when I first started at St. Martin School of Art, it was all about Prince. It was about Prince and Wham, actually. They were, they were the two sort of uh, opposing uh, option, musical options there. Um, but Prince was massively important um, to a lot of us uh, of that generation. It, sort of, it came after, you know, the punk thing, the punk, the new wave thing, the new, new romantic thing, and then suddenly Prince appeared um, and put things right. It just came from nowhere, didn't, didn't relate to anything. Um, so, yeah, purple for me is Purple Rain, and, it, and it's Prince. And I, w I promise not to mention colour again, Hardy. I can see there's a frustration in your eyes. Um... <laughs> Yeah. And, and, you know, the bootlace thing, God, I have no idea. I mean, really. <sighs> bootlace, bootlace, bootlace. Anyone got any ideas? What can we, what can we, what, how can I talk about a bootlace? Um. Do I prefer trainer? Do I prefer trainer? It depends on the occasion. I travel a lot by, by, by train, so I, I, I wear training shoes, but um, if I'm, yeah, yeah, no, no, pun, in, no pun intended. Um, I like, actually, Glenn, it's interesting you should, you should ask that, because the fate, obviously, the, the, you know, the best shoes in the world are brogues, yeah, brogues, yeah, we all, we all agree, yeah, brogues, you know, the, the shoes with like, lots of holes in them. And there's a ve this kind of takes me back to, back to cow piss again, actually, in a funny sort of way. Um, brogues are these very, very ornament, you know, very, very beautifully ornamented, uh, decorated um, shoes, leather shoes, classic shoes uh, that everyone thinks are, you know, classical, typical English shoes. They're not actually; they're, they came from Scotland. Um, and do you know the shoes I'm talking about, or not? They're like these incredibly, yeah, yeah. I can see doubt in your eyes. You're all wondering what, what, what I'm talking about. Um, basically, they were invented for purely practical reasons. So I think they, they sort of came about in the 17th, maybe early 18th century, something like that, a bit later. Yeah, 18th, mid-18th into the 19th century, something like this. And basically, people, at that time, people would be walking around in normal leather shoes. And because there was no, and this is where the cow piss comes into it, yeah? Because there was no drainage or very poor drainage in the, in the streets of Edinburgh or Glasgow, um, the guys or the cobblers, the shoemakers, yeah, started to make holes in the leather so that as you walk through a puddle full of piss, <laughs> your shoes would fill up with piss, but the holes would sort of expel the, sorry, the urine, sorry, international uh, audience. As you walked along, you know, your, your feet would sort of eject the, uh, the urine. This is a true story. You think I'm making this up? This is a true, this is a true story. Um, and then, you know, then, then, you know this, the, the drainage became better. Sue was invented, all the rest of it. But in the meantime, people had sort of grown fond of these sort of uh, perforated, you know, leather shoe wear. Um, so they, you know, it, it, it kind of, um, it, it kind of, it stayed from there. But it, it, it came about through, you know, a completely pra for practical purposes. Slightly tenuous connection to a pink, uh, sorry, a purple boot lace. But uh, there you go. Shoot. Yeah. Okay. Right. Next one. I'm going quite quickly, aren't I? I'm going to run out. Okay. A bottle of gin. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on here? You will find another one. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Oh right, let's talk about this. Another bottle of gin. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in charge here? It's a good sign for a break that you can have a you can try and Yeah? Oh we have a break in in a few minutes. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna talk about I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna warn you about the perils of drinking. Jägermeister, okay. Um, does it contain Waldmeister? No? Oh, shit. That, that screwed up, that screwed up my story. <laughs> Can we pretend it does? Yeah? As we all know, the most important ingredient in Jägermeister is actually Waldmeister, yeah? Um, 
and again, this is a bit of, this is a kind of a color story, but um, that is probably the worst German drink, it must be said. No, no, not too bad. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, I, personally, I don't like it. However, Waldmeister is one of the best, you know, German um, whatever, herbs or whatever it is. And one of my favorite products has to be um, Dolomiti ice cream. Do you know Dolomiti ice cream? That has that beautiful sort of three, three phase, three color, three, three color thingy. And it's lovely because the white bit's a bit tangy, a bit kind of sherbety. Then you kind of work your, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Then you'll work, you work your way through the, the lovely sort of strawberry gooey thing. <laughs> but the best comes at the end, yeah? Yeah? And it's like this big choc uh, chunk of block of uh, Waldmeister. It's absolutely yeah. fantastic. No. <laughs> it's not right. It's not, it's not, it's not for me. Okay. okay. Well, I thoroughly recommend it. If you, if you haven't tried this, you, you've, got to, um, you've got to try it. I think we're going to have a break at this stage. Is that right? Yeah? I'm going to have a couple more beers now that I've warmed up. So part, part tour is going to, be, uh, going to be a lot more fun. Also, I'm going to be looking for a hiwi. So if you don't want to p uh, be picked, hide from me yeah? <laughs> when I come over to the bar. Thank you very much. <laughs> Didn't, didn't you say something about um, By the way, by the way. Um, Volume. Don't go. Don't go. So, mach nochmal Sound an. Mach nochmal Ton an. Yeah. Hello, hello. So. During the break, this is your chance. During the break, um, as you know, we're live streaming. This space, this screen right now is being watched by tens of thousands of potential clients <laughs> and admirers. You can come here and mess around, do drawings, you know, promote yourself. It's yours. It can be so far removed that it has nothing to do with what you've got. Am I being too literal? Maybe in one or two cases where you were worried about, well, this is a shoestring, what did I see? It's a shoestring, but then it's Well, it got us onto the shoes, yeah. Well, like, what about what shoes do you wear? So literally, you did this, for example, you picked more the color of the thing.
Deus meu.
paar Helfer. Hallo, hallo. Ähm, darf ich kurz äh, um eure Aufmerksamkeit bitten? Damit mehr Leute dieses schöne, äh, dieses Kunstwerk hier sehen, könnt ihr alle kurz mal bei Form55, ich schreibe das gleich mal auf, auf die Facebook-Seite gehen und den Livestream teilen. Dann sehen das nämlich noch mehr Leute. Äh, ich brauche nur einen Zettel. Äh Are we on? Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah? Part two is about to start.
Okay, I think we're going to start. Who did this? Who did this? It's beautiful. And this. Okay. Adel. It's you. Very nice. Very nice. So. God. Okay. I've had another beer. Enna. Who's Enna? Hi, Enna. Right, I'm going to clear the decks a little bit here because we've got to carry on. I think at this stage it might be interesting if I have a, a co-pilot or an intern. Um, so they have to be fluent in five languages. <laughs> Cat Catalan, Spanish, Japanese, and a bit of German as well. Um, and I don't know how to pay. And they have to be complete, very, very incredibly quick uh, Googling images. Oh, really? Lars Bunker. Do we have a Lars Bunker in the house? <laughs> Lars. How many, beer, how many beers have you drunk so far? <laughs> One. One. Do you want to come and do it? I can't see you. Come on, Lars. Don't be shy. If this doesn't work out, we'll, 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 I'll just go through the audience, basically. We'll, we'll start with Lars. Where are you? Uh, <laughs> OK. Right. There's no time to lose here. So, is he coming? Take another one. Is he coming? Take no? Take Somebody else. Oh, God, OK. Um, I spoke about the colour red. In Liverpool, there are two football teams. Two football teams. Uh, how many teams are there in Hanover? Good teams. One. None. None. Well, well, it can't be as bad as Stuttgart. Oh, my students are going to kill me when they hear that. But anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I, so, in Liverpool, so I talked about the importance of red in my work and in my life, man. The other team is called... Who knows the name of the other team in Liverpool? You got them. And what colour are they playing? Blue. blue. So I need, I'm looking for somebody wearing something blue. I can't pick you. Can I pick you? That's not allowed. That's against the rules. I'm going to walk around. Right. If you right. So if you if you don't want to be picked and you you're wearing something blue, hide quickly. <laughs> Can't see a bloody thing. I'm going to come around here. Is that a blue hat? <laughs> is that is is that is that a blue hat? Yeah. Was that a really bad idea? I mean, I. <laughs> is that okay? Hi. What? Sorry, V high Stu? Christian. Christian. Hi. Can I get you a bit? Would you like some gin? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we can't, we can't, we can't block that. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, I picked you because you're wearing a hat. You know, it's all about hats tonight. And you're wearing a blue hat. So I need very quickly... Can you... Are you kind of teched up? Yeah, can you... Very quickly, because a few people have said, what the hell is a brogue shoe? Can you, like, uh, print out a brogue that's B R O G U E, brogue. B R O G U G. Sorry, not G U G U E, brogue. Shoe. And while he's doing that, I'm going to get something else out of the box. I think this. Day. Sorry, Anna. Sorry to destroy your work of art, but um. 
I was trying to work out what we can draw, with, what we can write with these letters. Does, has anyone, like, is anyone good at anagrams here? Or? Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'll leave those there and think about it. Um, <laughs> great. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's obviously very bored there. Thanks, Lars, for your help, by the way, wherever you are. Yeah. Um, and moving rapidly along. Moving rapidly along. I need my glass. Mit mein Brille. Oops. Let's have a look. There's another yellow ball. Why two yellow balls? Okay, I can go back in there. Let's try. Let's try. Uh, what the hell's this? That's an invitation to a wedding. <laughs> no, not that. That's not going to work. Um, God. There's got to be something in here somewhere. Okay, well, I mean, did you find a brogue, a brogue shoe? Excellent, 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 excellent. Um, or you can send it, to, you can WhatsApp it, and we'll, uh, I'll, I'll show people. So, this is like a commercial break. After this, there is going to be um, not the cool shit club. Is this like a local club or something? There is going to be a party in this space called Panic, um, which is how I'm feeling right now. So uh, that kind of... Have we got the brogue? Yeah, no, we, we it's coming. Okay, there's no... Use the admin of the computer. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> that's the brogue, yeah. That's the one, that's the one. Yeah. Can't you just... Uh, Let's have a look. Yeah. Let's have a look. That's just a photo. Let's do it. Can I just take a photo of it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> can you see that? Yeah, can you see that? Yeah. That is a brogue. <laughs> it was worth it, wasn't it? But there are some very, very spectacular ones that are completely covered in uh, perforations. But you get the idea, yeah? I obviously picked the right guy for the job. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, the Cool Shit Club. Um, amazing. I recommend it. Yeah, you've got to go there. It's uh, the, but, the, you know, the, the, the better club tonight is obviously going to be Panic, which will take place after this. Keep going. Right. Oh, we got the shoe, yeah. Here we go. We made it, yeah? That's for you, Glenn. A Scottish invention. <laughs> right, this is some kind... OK, now we're going to play Identify the Font, OK? This is for the typographers in the room. You see that? It... Exactly, exactly. You got it. You got it. Can you see that? It's not Rockwell. You're all thinking Rockwell. Do we know what this is? No. You lose your beer, whoever who is that. That is that is not Cooper. That is so not Cooper. It's Slab Serif. Somebody said Slab Serif. It's kind of Rockwell-esque, but it's not Rockwell, I don't think. Um, what can we say about this? Uh, you know, uh, God, you know, uh, Slab Serif, uh, stickers, Letraset. Letraset. Okay. Christian. Christian. <laughs> you have 30 seconds to... <laughs> To identify this font, I, wanna, I want to know the designer. 
What the font? <laughs> Good luck. Uh, it's quite interesting drop shadow just creeping in there. It's quite nice. Um, mm, 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 right, okay. While he's doing that. Can I take a photo? And yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. My favorite typeface. Hey, can you find out the name of the band of the Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 Make <a> show. <laughs> I said, honestly, we were so bad. It's been, it's been erased. It's been erased. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm so old that, that the, inter the internet didn't exist in those days. <laughs> That's what, one of the advantages of being old, you know. Um, my favorite typography, it's like the classic, oh God, I was gonna say Cooper, but somebody else mentioned that. Favorite, God, it's really difficult, isn't it? I never know, I mean, it depends, I mean, it kind of depends on the, you know, on the job a little bit. Everything, sh I try and kind of justify every decision I make, it, there has to be a reason. It's not about, you know, following, oh, I'm gonna use my favorite font on this job, it's, it has to, there has to be a reason. For example, um, Eric Gill, Gill Sands. Yeah, I'm English. It's the obvious choice. I've never used Gill Sands. I, 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 I don't like Gill Sands, I'm afraid. Um, people in London are going to be horrified when they hear that. Um, I've only ever used Franklin Gothic once. In the 80s and the 90s, Franklin Gothic was everywhere. Um, and I only ever found the, re you know, the reason, justified use of it uh, once, and that was designing. Again, talking about Andy Warhol, I did um, um, an exhibition design in Barcelona for the Joan Miró Foundation, if anyone's been there. And I was delighted because I could finally use this typeface that everyone was kind of using. I'd, I'd found like a, um, a reason to justify it. The non-type nerds in the room are probably wondering what the hell I'm talking about, but um, I tried to have a you know, reason to... Um, and other fonts, God, I like Plantin. Do you know Plantin? Yeah, my first book, I said it in Plantin. It's like the, the father of times, Times New Roman. Um, I like Din. I mean, I spend a lot of time, I know it's really obvious and it's kind of, day, it's like really overused maybe in the 90s or something. But um, because I spend a lot of, t a significant amount of time on trains in Germany, I'm the proud, proud owner of a, of a barn card. Um, so I, in my first year teaching in Stuttgart, I used to fly there and, at the, and then to Barcelona and London and all over, and Sao Paulo when I was there. And at the end of the year, I, I kind of looked at the amount of flights that I'd taken and I, I decided that, that that wasn't good for me or the planet or anybody. Um, so I invested in a barn card and now I spend hours and hours and hours looking out of the windows and it's fant absolutely fantastic in Germany because, uh, you know, on the side of all of the cargo uh, freight trains and things, there's always this beautiful, din language. It's amazing. And it's amazing because it's not designed. This is interesting, actually. Um, it's like some of my favorite architecture isn't designed by architects. It's designed by engineers. And din, so these guys who are like putting the, you know, the coding and the, the type on the side of, of these trains. They're, they're not trained type, typographic designers. They're just engineers who like, you know, filling in blocks of information. And it just works. It always looks amazing. Din, you know, containers, whenever you see containers down, you know, down one side, down the ends, they have, you have these very, very beautiful sort of default um, type applications. Everyone's gone very quiet. Do you all hate Din or something? Do I say the wrong? <laughs> is, is, is Din really unpopular in Hanover or something? I thought it made you all proud. Oh yeah, Din, yeah, Deutsche, Deutsche. <laughs> um, having said that, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think, unless I was designing a, t a train or a, a, t a container, I don't think I could, um, I could justify using it. Um, I think other type, I mean, I like calligraphy. I'm a bit sick of, I mean, I, I love people who do calligraphy properly. It's, it's fantastic. And there's a couple of very nice examples on the table. Thank you, wherever you are. Um, but I, d I really like handwriting. 
Um, and my stepmother was very influential. She kind of joined my family at the age when I was kind of looking for a, a cool kind of person's handwriting to copy. And she had this very, very, very beautiful, um, uh, just very natural, bit scrappy, bit rough. My handwriting. Yeah. It's completely illegible. <laughs> but, um, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's try and do this. This is my... So later on, apparently I've got to sign 100 posters. Is that right, Hardy? Yeah. You will get one of these, okay? You can do my signature, yeah? <laughs> and, me, and me and Hardy go to the cool shit club. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. That's, that's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Do you want to take over here, actually? I'll, 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 and I'll Google shoes or whatever you're doing. This is what my writing looks like. It has to be a really thick pen. I don't know if it's going to work in blue. I only ever write in black, but I'll try it. Are you ready? Okay. It's quite hard with, you know... 10,000 people watching you to do this. <laughs> Panic. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny, because, and I always do it really big. You know, in, in, the, in the supermarket, I always do it really, really big. And I, because I love the reaction of, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the person on the till. They just, they kind of look at it, <laughs> and they look at me, and it's like, okay, okay. So uh, Gordon, recreate a, a, a long piece of paper to represent, like, a, a receipt. And <laughs> yeah. side on the, on the receipt. Absolutely massive, honestly. Get me the paper. I can fill any... <laughs> Let's do this properly, yeah? If it's really long, I would, I would also include my, my, my familiar number. Let's see if we can do this. I really need a bigger pen. I need like a... A red. Yeah? Is it thick? Ah, uh, it's got to be really thick. Sorry, I, don't, I didn't want to appear to be ungrateful. Though. I've complete, this, the great thing is that we've completely forgotten about the box right now. <laughs> Is that getting better? I can go really big. Um, anyway, it, I, I do it basically because it just to confuse people in supermarkets. That's why I do that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So typeface. I completely ignore you, you, your question. Uh, whoever asked. I'm not going to say Helvetica. I'm not going to say Times. I don't know what I'm going to say. Um, I don't know. God. Typeface. That typeface that you're yeah. researching, that'll do. It's yeah. completely fine. It's uh, Rockwell or Sheffield. Oh, it is Rockwell. Yeah. Okay, so, well, it's a, a bit of a funny cut, but if you say so, who am I to argue? Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's keep it moving. Yeah. Buildings, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> They're both in Liverpool. <laughs> both in Liverpool, although I was slightly envious when uh, Hardy was giving me a walk around, uh, a tour of um, Hanover today. We came in on the bikes. He gave me the really uncomfortable bike. By the way. <laughs> He's like, just kind of... And everyone's like waving, hey, Hardy. Yeah? And I'm on this very strange... I will get back to your quest, don't worry. I was on this very, very strange bike that um, if you stop pedalling, the whole thing just freezes. Yeah? Like the, the, the pedal was a very, very odd, very odd system. Um, but amongst other buildings that we saw, and I, I, for a moment I was slightly concerned, I was slightly concerned. We saw the, um, the Conti factory, Continental. Yeah, it's huge. Respect, respect. <laughs> We've actually got a bigger one in Liverpool. 
Um, it's my favorite building in the world. It's, complete, it's now become completely impractical. Um, it was built, could you Google? I, I keep forgetting, this is great, isn't it? Can you get me a beer as well? I mean, what, what are you doing over there? <laughs> um, can you Google the, the Stanley Tobacco Warehouse? And while you're doing that, I'll answer your question. My second, that's my favorite uh, building in the world. Basically, it's the, the largest brick structure ever known to man, yeah, ever built out of big, yeah, like individual bricks. It's absolutely colored. It's ridiculous. It's so big. It just goes on forever. Um, it's completely and utterly listed, protected by UNESCO, World Heritage, or something, because it's just so unbelievably gigantic. And the problem that they have is, it's quite sad actually, um, it was built as a, a warehouse for tobacco. And to enter the goods, to deliver the goods into the building, they had, very, they had like railways, okay? So between each floor, the ceilings are very, very low. Okay, they would look like guys on trains would go into the building and they would just sort of offload the boxes of tobacco that were coming into the port of Liverpool. The problem is that, um, you know, the shipping and everything kind of ceased to end in the 60s, 70s um, in Liverpool. And since then, it's laid, uh, it's been empty, basically. And they don't know what to do with it. Normally, they sort of convert it into very nice uh, kind of yuppie apartments and things <laughs> like that. But because of this problem with the, the ceilings... It, <laughs> very good. You need a lot of kinders. I don't know if there aren't many kinders in, in Liverpool, quite honestly. Um, so, yeah, have you got it yet? Yeah. It's coming, guys, it's coming. It's worth it. It's really worth it. <laughs> and the second one is, um, well, it has to be Liverpool Station. It's not the most beautiful, but for me, obviously, for you know, sentimental reasons, it was where my journey began in life, man. Yeah, it's the, the station I went to to kind of leave my family to get me down to London. Um, and like most of the Victorian train stations, and you know, the same in Germany, same all over, all over Europe, um, they were designed by engineers. They, they weren't designed by architects. Architecture was, wasn't really, didn't really exist. Um, they, they uh, you know, build a structure, it's gotta have a span of, you know, whatever, 200, 200 feet. And they'd just find a way to sort of, using the materials and the limited technology they had. Um, here's the Stanley, Ware, Stanley Tobacco Dock Warehouse. I should know this, shouldn't I? Seven, seven or eight. They yeah, they're all tiny, yeah. Except for the top one, which is really low. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you an idea, and I don't want to, don't get offended. Okay, don't get offended. The Conti factory. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Sorry, guys. But it's, it's true. It's true. So... Liverpool? One? Not point 0.5. OK. <laughs> to be friendly, yeah. If you're ever in Liverpool, it's sort of... Um, it's not in any of the tourist guides, um, but you've got to go. It's, it's absolutely it's extraordinary. And not only that, it's where there's a very important canal uh, connects Liverpool with the North East, called uh, the Leeds to Liverpool Canal. And it was a very, very important sort of archery during the Industrial Revolution. That comes out um, into this dock here. The Stanley Warehouse. What's it got to do with the, book, uh, the box? Not very much, but um, anyway, let's keep going. Okay. Golly. No, I can't do that. There's another typographic game there. What is, what on earth is this thing? What, what is this? What could this possibly be? Does anybody know what this is? 
Is it like an engine part or something? Is it a... 3D printing. Oh, it's 3D printing. I've heard about this. <laughs> <laughs> but what is it? Is it designed by you? No. No, I printed that one. Okay. I, I downloaded it. Is it true that the printers, when... <laughs> really? <laughs> is it true that, that the printers can print themselves? If, if you get like a broken... This is like a... Yes. If a part breaks, you just go, oh, all right, print part, whatever. <laughs> That's a bit weird, isn't it, no? Or is it just me who's, who's a bit creeped out? Maybe, you know, maybe you're all so young and, you know, it, it doesn't matter. But for me, that kind of freaks me out a little bit. It's a bit sinister. Um, you can print the whole printer. You can print the whole printer. Yeah, yeah. And guns. And, uh, yeah. It's very beautiful. I thought initially maybe it was like a, a part of a, a continent, a conti... Um, wheel something or other, but no, obviously not. There is a kind of industrial reference there that I quite like. It's like a fan belt, like a, ve a ventilator from a shaft, uh, from, a, from a car engine. It's very beautiful. Is it very expensive to print this? About 30 cents. 30 cents? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but it takes three months or something. There has to be like a, a drawback. Um, two, hours, I think. Uh? two hours. Two hours. It's great. Thirty cents. I mean, why do that's that's you know why do cheap things? Cheap things are invariably really crap, aren't they? They're like really ugly. They don't have to be. No, if you take a bit of time, you know, thirty cents. It's beautiful. You go into IKEA with thirty cents. You you, you don't buy anything. Huh? I've got to be a bit careful what I say about IKEA because I sell prints. In IKEA. <laughs> Sorry. I, I used to sell prints uh, through IKEA. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> it's coming up. Hang on. The what? Sorry? Oh, yeah, the Dutch designer. What the hell is this? It is this guy here. Yeah, yeah. We want to know. Can you, right now? Will I, will I go out for a, for a burrito in the burrito bar? What the hell's this? Right, while you're doing that, um, this is an abomination. Thanks, Hardy. This is yours, is it? Oh, okay. It's a selfie stick, isn't it? Yes. I don't do, I'm not on Facebook. How do you use it? How, but I don't understand how you fit the phone on there. Which, oh, okay. Who owns a selfie stick? <laughs> oh, yeah, apart, apart, apart from Glenn, because that's it. <laughs> You've kind of thrown me. Does that, I mean... Yeah? There was. Where is that person? Have they le they, they've just left the building right now. Yeah, good. Hey, it's complete. I believe you. Hey, they're everywhere. I'm sure you're right. We're, we're, you know, we're, it's too advanced for us. We're, we're, we'll get there eventually. We'll get there right. I guess there are worse things, you know, but we are kind of... Yeah, I mean, I, well, because we have a self, two selfie stick owners in the house, I've got to be a little bit careful what I say. A selfie with other people? Are you crazy? <laughs> Are you fucking crazy or what? Well, I don't know. I, well, I, sadly, I didn't bring my GoPro camera. Otherwise, <laughs> uh, otherwise, I would. And why do I need a selfie stick yeah. if I have Christian? <laughs> <laughs> And some tires. Should we do this? <laughs> Christian, can you convert this and can you make this uh, iPhone compatible, please? <laughs> and take a photograph of me with these guys. Yeah. 
and try not to drop my brand new iPhone 7 if possible. Right, um, <laughs> keep going. Did you bring your selfie stick here? Uh, just use tape. Use tape. This is a joke, is it? Presumably. Huh? What, what is this? It's for your beard. It's for my beard. Um, yeah, it's music. We need like a, a piece of whatever, grease proof paper or whatever. Um, no, more interesting, more interesting is the fact there are three, es gibt drei Buchstaben. B, C, N, B, C, N. Barcelona, urban hotels, stolen from urban hotels in Barcelona. <laughs> borrowed, borrowed. borrowed. <laughs> Barcelona. Okay, so as, as Glenn said in the introduction, um, I lived in, in Barcelona. I've still got a place in Barcelona, actually. Um, I moved there. Basically, I left the Royal College of Art in 89. Now, you're all trying to work out how old I am, aren't you? Okay. I, I left the Royal College of Art in 1989. It was a very bad time to graduate and to look for work. There was very little work around. There was a recession. There were bits and pieces of work, but the kind of work that I was getting wasn't well paid and it wasn't particularly interesting. Um, so I had this sort of dream that I'd just get out of, um, of London and the UK. There was a bad government at the time who was sort of starting to impose, bring in tuition fees and starting to, you know, privatise national industries, things like that. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to go all political about this. Anyway, the, long, the short version is that I, I decided to get out of there. Um, Plan A was to move to L.A., Los Angeles. Um, so I got a job as a bicycle messenger, courier, yeah, in London, which is, you know, was interesting for a couple of years. Uh, the plan being to sort of, you know, save up enough money and then sort of fly off to, 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 to L.A. and, you know, start up a new life. Eighteen months into it, I had an, ac I had an accident and I broke my arm. I broke my elbow. I have a wire in my elbow. And um, I'd like to say that it happened while, it, while I was working. It didn't. I'd been drinking. It was like after work. <laughs> I was, you know, young and stupid. Now I'm old and stupid, but that's, that's another story. Um, so I, when I woke up and, the, you know, they, and they sort of put a wire in my arm and all the rest of it, I decided that I'd, I'd, I just had to get out of the UK. I didn't have enough money. I looked at my bank account. No, I didn't because there was no internet then. But I, I kind of called my bank. <laughs> or I wrote a letter to my bank, or, or however we used to communicate in those days. <laughs> God, I went to my bank. <laughs> I walked to my bank, and I knocked on the door. It used to be so much easier in the old days. Um, and I realized that I didn't have enough money to get out to LA, so I thought, well, maybe somewhere, anywhere but the UK, somewhere where I can be poor, but somewhere warm. And it was 1991, it was the year before the Olympic Games took, part in, took the, uh, place in Barcelona. And I decided, with my girlfriend I did, uh, of, at the time, I decided that we're just going to go out to Barcelona. There was no plan, I couldn't speak a word of Spanish, I didn't have any contacts, you know, no mobile phones, no internet, nothing like that. I just sort of got on a plane with my big portfolio, you know, mappen, the huge mappen under my arm, and went off to Barcelona. It's crazy, absolutely stupid idea actually because I turned up there um, in those days not many people spoke English uh, in Spain it's all kind of changed now if you've been there recently it's, they're all kind of you know the, the young Catalans and Spaniards are all you know very fluent great um, and I was very very lucky that I um, ended up designing a book for a guy called Javier Mariscal do you know about Javier Mariscal he designed the uh, the, the 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 mascot for the uh, for the Barcelona Olympics and um, that job kind of saved my life. It was the only job I could have done because essentially it's like a big sort of, what we call in English, uh, a coffee table book, so like a nice big 
18 by 18 inch, um, you know, 256 page, you know, proper book, explaining the creative process behind um, the conception of um, uh, the Olympic mascot. And I say it's the only job I could do because it was basically, it was a picture book. So th there was no kind of language barrier in there. So it kind of saved my life. Um, Barcelona, I guess many of you have been there. Hardy's been, anyone has been to Barcelona? You lived there. I lived. You lived. I lived. I lived. Oh, okay. Okay. Whereabouts were you? Whereabouts? Which part? In Que Barrio? Yeah, very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah very cool. Very cool. Um, it's a fantastic city. How can I promote Barcelona? Because they're, they're all watching. Hey, Barcelona. Um, just go and work it out for yourself. Oh, okay, we're done. Yeah. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> this is going to work. It's going to work. That's absolutely brilliant. Did you cover the lens? No. Okay. <laughs> You've got to, we, we need you in here as well. Yeah. The idea is that we're going to... You should do this. Come here, because you're, you're, you're the expert. I'll just sit in, in the audience. It was you, wasn't it? We need a professional. Give us a demonstration. That's, working, yeah, that's a great. Uh, I just tried not to, to put it on the screen. So it's a bit no. Oh, you can't see me. Oh, you have to. Oh, is no, it you one? Have to switch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. now it's working. The okay, the timer. Shall we say three seconds or ten seconds? What do you think? Three or ten seconds? Ten, ten seconds. seconds. Ten seconds. Yeah. Ten seconds. Yeah. But you have to hold it. I, no, you should. You hold it. I'm going for a beer. <laughs> I'm gonna go around there. Can you take a second photo? Yeah? Oh. No, I, I'm fine here. No? I'm oh, not in the middle, really. No. Oh, this is really embarrassing. Okay, go on. Okay, guys. Whoops. I think we all have to do Six, that as well, okay. huh? Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Unbelievable, yeah, yeah. Let's get that up on the big screen somehow. Thank you very much. Can we have uh, some applause? Then? So, yeah, Barcelona, Barcelona, great, great city. Let's keep going. Next up. These are kind of related. This is more sort of appropriate for me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <gasps> what can I talk about? Um, are you a fan I was going to talk about Poseidon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Do I, it's quite nice that it's green. Is it, in, in England, we say you have green fingers if you're into gardening. You have green, is that the same? Auf Deutsch, yeah? Green, um, Gruner, no, 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 Daumen. Gruner Daumen, yeah? I don't have green fingers, sadly. But um, my father does. My, my parents are both, they're, you know, like good English people. 80-year-old English or 75 and 80-something-year-old people. They're in the garden every day, you know, digging away. It's really beautiful because I, I'm completely clueless, if I'm being really honest. I'm definitely an urbanite. Um, but when I visit, I w went to visit them um, two or three weeks ago. And I just love the tour of the garden. It's absolutely beautiful. I think they're both artists. They wouldn't, I mean, they would be very embarrassed if I, if I called them that. But the amount of sort of curating that goes on and the inspiration just to, you know, to lay out flowers and to look after flowers. It's such a beautiful thing. Um, I'm very, very proud of them and very, in, in, in a way, I'm sort of very, very envious that they, they do have this sort of natural instinct. Um, and what is particularly nice is that my father, they completely, they, they, they operate in completely different zones. It's just like a very, very clear line. <laughs> and, and neither crosses either way. It's just like really, really clear, okay? So my father does roses, just roses, yeah? That side is all roses, yeah? And my stepmother is 
far more practical fruit and vegetables, yeah? And the beauty of them. Uh, so not, not only is it, does it look amazing, but um, you, you, can, you can eat the, pro uh, the produce. Thank you very much. Bang on cue. I was getting a bit concerned there. Um, what else can I say about that? Yeah, um, it's just, um, it's absolutely, it's kind of making me wonder why, I, why I'm, I'm, I'm so hopeless in the garden. We are guardians of the planet. You know, we should, we should look after it. Yeah, you know, the environment. Very poignant. I like that. I'm feeling very bad. I'm feeling bad already, actually. Uh, are there any keen gardeners in the house? Do you have allotments in, in, uh, in Hanover? Do you have this um, tradition of having a, like a little hooter? Yeah, with your, with your flag, your football team flag. <laughs> and, your, and your little cool shrank. And your <laughs> they're, re they're really big in Berlin, actually, these things. A friend of mine's just uh, managed to get in. And they're incredibly difficult to enter into. You know, they're like these closed societies, impenetrable. And he's been trying for years and years. He's finally uh, got, got like a little hut and some land. So soon we're going to be eating some, uh, you know, house gemacht. No, not homemade, but homegrown kartoffeln. <laughs> Amongst other things, I hope. Right. Gardening. The planet, man. Look after it. We've only got one. <laughs> right. Um, God, I keep picking up the same thing and then putting it, then looking at it and... I, I mean, <sighs> intern, yeah. now's your chance. Well, I can only assume it's some sort of a kind of interactive game or something. Yeah. Can you give us a demonstration, please? I'll try. Yeah. Bas basically, it's a test to work out how sober you are, yeah, how many beers you've had. Yeah, if sure. you <laughs> Dun, dun. I thought, I thought it's oh, I thought I was going to blow it. Hey, you're good. You're good. <laughs> Keep going. You, you can't sit down until you've done it at least once. <laughs> Oh, that was, yeah, yeah, almost there. Oh. Who put it in the box? Uh, yes, Glenn. Come, come and show us. Come and show. Oh. You're getting worse. <laughs> oh, is it possible? <laughs> it begs the question. You get a crate of beers if, if, if you manage. Yep. This is a really bad idea. Yeah, I guess shorter's kind of easier, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, just straight like this. Here we go. Maybe it's a bit easier with uh, your eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> Am I Ricardo? All right, here we go. In one, in one. Oh, fuck. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> Moving right. So, yeah, Pinocchio. Pinocchio. Oh, no. What can I say about Pinocchio that hasn't already been said? <laughs> I don't really do... I don't know. It, it wasn't actually that big in England when I was growing up, Pinocchio. It was kind of too fantastical. We don't do fantasy in Liverpool. Um, so I'm the wrong per I'm not qualified to, to talk about Pinocchio. 
But as you can see, you can have hours and hours of fun with this thing, so um, <laughs> every home should have one. Right, let's go. Here we go. 3D printer. So everything I said before, just, yeah, project it onto that, okay? Um, intern, can you tell me something about this, please? A box within a box within a box. Well, what should I say about it? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of yellow. It's like a recur. It's a recurring theme, isn't it? Yeah. I can't. I've been banned. Um, Hardy Hardy said that I'd be thrown out if I no, no more beer if I mention color again. Color's good. Okay. It's a bit like getting back to Joseph Albers, isn't it? Like squares within. You know, Joseph. This, this series, yeah? squares within squares and stuff. Oh man, we look brilliant. <laughs> We look great. You look slightly startled, I must say. <laughs> you look amazing. I mean, you've obviously been, been practicing doing so for <laughs> I just look old. <laughs> great, OK. Um, yeah, squares, I don't know, 3D print. Oh, I don't know, it's kind of, what can we say about this? Um, what is it? What is it? Is it art? Does it have a use? What is art? It's an inception. What is art? What? Sorry. It's an inception. An inception. Yes, it's an inception, everybody. <laughs> Whatever that means. Come up here and explain it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Jesus Christ, yeah, maybe. OK, we'll meet back tomorrow morning. I've, I've got to research that one, I think. I'm going to keep looking. You know, I mean, if, if, if there wasn't an expert in the house, I'd, uh, I'd have a go. But knowing that you know... Yeah, you get... Can we uh, have a beer for her? No, oh, OK. OK. Is this what I think it is? A Cuban cigar. It's not a Cuban cigar, but it's, um, it's a cigar. Um, a whiskey Glen Farkless guitar. It's all booze and like really bad things in this box. I, we <laughs> um, I can, I, can, I guess this kind of brings me on to Cuba. Who's been to Cuba? Anyone been to Cuba? Yeah? Um, when were you there? Last year. Okay. And? Yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> After Fidel's death or before? It was just before. I think. Just before. OK. Just before. Yeah. Because I was there. I mean, I got there. So it's really changed a hell of a lot. I, I was there sort of early 90s a couple of times. And um, there were no kind of prop, you know, normal, modern cars. It was all like this. You probably still see the old Buicks and things driving the streets, but it was, it was I think I just caught like, the end of the, uh, the old thing. Now I see stuff on, on YouTube, and it, it just looks like another kind of, many other kind of cities all over the place. But um, what can I say about Cuba? Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. Obviously very, very important to me because of the, um, the print thing. They've got this thriving, really beautiful... Because, you know, because of the trade embargo and, you know, things like this, they have very, very basic resources, okay? So there's no... It's probably... Again, it's probably... I'm talking about, you know, some time ago. They had no digital printing. So they, the, 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 the analogue silk screen tradition was still very, very much... Very alive, very much intact. Um, and I spent a lot of time visiting little studios and things. Absolutely wonderful. And I learned something there that was, well, hundreds of things there from the Cubans, absolutely brilliant people, make, improvising with absolutely nothing, just kind of getting by, um, recycling everything. And um, I learned a great tip, great printing tip in, a, in, a, um, in one of the, uh, the Siebdruck Werkstatts in Habana, La Habana. I went in there, and I'd been noticing that the black, the, so they use a lot of black and white um, in, 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 the, in the printing, and it had a kind of, you'd see it all over the city. Um, 
But I think the most spectacular installation of silk screens was in the, I think it's called La Casa del, del, uh, del uh, Cine, the, 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 the House of Cinema. And it's like the, the most important, it's where the, the Cuban Film Institute is housed basically in Havana. And you walk into this amazing space and they've got, you know, 40 or 50 years of posters hung all over the walls. And you walk in and it's like, whoa, this is incredible. Then you look up and they've got them all over the ceiling as well. It's absolutely incredible. Every surface is covered in, in uh, posters. Amazing. And looking closer, I kind of noticed that they were using lots of different blacks. Yeah? Here we've just got black. There they had like lots of you know, tiny, like, turn out tiny little nuances, like t tiny uh, differences between these very subtle shades of black. And I just thought, this is so cool. You know, they're, they're, they're so really completely obsessed with detail and getting the tones and different blacks. How cool is that? So I went into a, a Zeebdruck Werkstatt and I said, How do you get, where do you get this whole range of these very, very beautiful blacks? We don't get these in Europe. How do you do it? And he kind of looked at me in a funny kind of way, and he, he said, uh, but ¿qué pasa? ¿Qué te pasa? You know, what are you, what are you talking about? I said, well, these blacks, I mean, none of them, they're, they're all slightly different blacks. How do you get it? He said, oh, muy fácil. This is very easy. Um, we don't have any black. We can't get black. <laughs> so I'm like, but everything's printed in black. He goes, yeah, yeah, no. What we do is we take all of the inks that have been left over, <laughs> and we just mix them all up into a big bucket, yeah? And then sort of add a bit of something or other. So that it's a sort of accidental uh, thing that just makes this very, very beautiful uh, range of... Um, anyway, you get the idea, no? <laughs> Whiskey, cigars, Havana. Um, getting back to my... Um, you asked about typography. This isn't a commercial typeface, but... Um, again, because... When I was there, you know, very, very limited, you know, money to spend on road signs and things like this. They had this very, very beautiful um, um, typeface, like a stenciled typeface. So they weren't able to print or to, you know, a lot of European signs that cut out of vinyls or silk screen. They didn't have money to do that. They were doing them all with um, hand-cut stencils. Yeah, just like cutting letter by letter and then painting them with a, like a, um, a short brush. I've got one here. Um, and they have these really, I'll draw one actually. I was told to draw more, so I'm going to give you like a little demonstration here. So, you know, the way that we would do an A I've got, I've, would be like a stencil A would be something like this, no? With a bridge. Yeah? More or less, no? The way they do it is amazing. This is where I completely screw up because I'm doing it from memory, and it was 20 years ago. They had these A's that were, so you start with an A, and then they had these amazing, how was it? They had like these quite kind of eccentric bridges going on, like these kind of diagonal, you know, you know in the West, they're, they're normally kind of, yeah, follow the, like, like the, the path of the whatever supporting. They had this brilliant kind of, system of, of just like designing these very, very beautiful. Could you find, um, I did a book called um, Protest Stencil Toolkit. Prote Patrick Thomas, Protest Stencil Toolkit. If you print out the cover, I'll show you. Um, that completely fed into um, a job that I did. Um, a few years ago, I was asked to make a book about stencils. Um, and I've been using stencils since I was a student. It's not like a kind of recent Banksy kind of type thing. I've been using them for a long time. And um, I got a, a friend of mine who works for a, a London publishing house called Lawrence King Publishing, who I'm sure you're aware of their books, asked me to make this book. And I made it about stencils. And I want to show you one of the letter forms because it was directly influenced by a Cuban road, road sign, actually. Um, I don't know if you can see it here or not. I can't see it very well. Can you see that O? Can you see that O? If I draw it, can you isolate the O and just like enlarge it? I'm going to draw it so you can see what's going on. The bridges are like that, yeah? Can you see? Well, you'll see it now when he, when he prints out the, uh, the bigger version. Basically, it was 
it was that. It was looking at what they were doing. The, these kind of quite very, very strange, very individual sort of bridges. Um, this book that I did... was about protesting. The original commission was make a book about your work and you know, make stencils of your work so people can sort of you know, copy your work or whatever, reproduce your work. And I thought it'd be much more interesting not to, for me to step back and to look at symbols of popular protest throughout uh, the 20th century and to put them all into a book. Um, okay, so it's about protesting. So on the cover, the zero with these diagonal bridges is also meant to very subtly, quite subliminally, uh, reference a peace sign. Okay? It's just very, very subtly uh, dropped into there. He's going to print that. I'm going to move on, I think. Are you all still awake? Yeah? <laughs> Can't see a bloody thing. Right. Let's keep going. Aha. Here we go. The moment has arrived. Five minutes, yeah? Does anybody know what this is? <laughs> has it been exposed? Is it to use? Has it been exposed? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's quite a modern one because it's after they fucked up the logo, isn't it? <laughs> this is so nice. Why did they do that? Why did they do that? I don't know what the story is with Kodak now. Is it, did it, is it completely over? Is it coming back again? Or does anybody know? Do people still... No? They're still going. Okay. Well, I don't think that logo is doing them any favours because it's kind of starting to look very dated since that. Yeah, I think so, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that looked... Immediately it started to look very dated. Um, anyway, let's not start uh, criticising uh, Kodak logos. They, they've got bigger problems uh, to deal with, I think. Um, photography. I know nothing about photography, quite honestly. And it's quite ironic because I spend my entire life posting uh, pictures on Instagram. I can't take a good photo. I really can't. If you look at the way that I, I show anybody, who, and I'm not going to, you know, a bit of shameful self-promotion here, but anybody who does look at my uh, Twitter feeds and, or Instagram yeah, feeds, yeah, perfect, yeah. I got yeah. A, um, ah. Okay, let's come back to that. Let's, we'll end with that, I think. Yeah, you get the idea from that, yeah. So, hang on, this way up, it's the peace sign. That is the, the Cuban street sign. Yeah, just two completely unrelated things coming together. It's just one of those moments when, when, when I saw two things in a sketchbook and I thought, oh, that's actually quite nice. That could work quite nicely. Um, getting back to the film, I've completely forgotten what I was going to say. Thank you very much, Christian. I was right in the... <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah, Instagram. I, so I'm, I'm very bad at taking photographs. It, you will notice that I use... And it's a trick. It's not a trick. But it's something that I think I learned from Stanley Kubrick. You know Stanley Kubrick, the film director? Barry Lyndon. You ever seen Barry Lyndon, the film? You will have seen Barry Lyndon. No? Best film ever made, Barry Lyndon, Stanley Kubrick. He uses constantly throughout his work, throughout his work, constantly he uses something called one-point perspective, which is just like straight on photographing. So you get these very, very symmetric uh, perspective, you know, disappearing lines and all, all, all of the rest of it. That's what I do. I copy that from Kubrick, okay? Because <laughs> I'm not very good at, you know, all of that. So just like, if in doubt, just like, you know, get it as square as possible and, you know, you, you can't go wrong, basically. Um, okay, Christian. The poem. Yeah. We're going to end with a poem. Have, oh, okay. Auf Deutsch. Quick biography. No, it's in English, actually. This is going to make a lot of sense, isn't it? Right, okay. <laughs> so... Paul van Ostayen, born on the 22nd of February, 1896, died on the 18th of March, 1928, was a Belgian poet and writer. And this is the translation. And this is the bit that kind of slightly... Oh, 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 okay. So you didn't, you didn't translate it with, with Google Translate or something. Okay, right. 
Okay, that's good. Do I read this out? Yeah? <laughs> Why did you pick this one? Why did you pick Okay, so, so the title is, the title is, any marks in the room? Mark? Mark? There must be a Mark. Mark? Mark, do you want a beer? Where are you? Mark? Okay, Mark, the title is Mark Greets Things in the Morning. Here we go. This was a really good idea, thank you. Hi, boy, with the bike, on the vase, on the bloom, plume, plume. High chair by the table, high bread on the table. High fisher of fish with the pipe, and high fisher of fish with cap, cap and pipe, of the fisher of fish. Hi, I fish. Hi, little fish. Hi, tiny, fishy, fine of mine. The end. And Thank you very much. I think, I think that's... Um, <clears throat> No, I just want to say one thing. I think that's as good a point as any to, to end on, quite honestly. Um, I was running out of things in the box. Thank you all very, very much. Obviously, I'm going to be around now drinking heavily for the next two hours. <laughs> do you want questions now, or do I just kind of hang out? Yeah. Does anybody have any... I know I explained everything so incredibly well. <laughs> but does anybody possibly have, like, a, a little question for me? about anything related to this mess, or me, or, or anything, or... We're going to be around, so... I'm going to be here. Apparently, I'm going to be signing posters. Yeah. I very, very happily, um, if you want one, you don't have to take one. <laughs> um, but it's um, a limited edition of, I think, 100. Um, I'm going to sign them, dedicate them, if you want it dedicated with a very big signature or a very... I can, I can also do very... I can also do like a, a, a bookstaber, you know, if, if you don't want me to, uh, to uh, kind of mess it up. That's right, yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm done. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Um, let's all have a beer together and keep talking, yeah? Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, normalerweise um, sagt sag mal am Ende. Uh, oh, sorry, in English, yes, yeah, sure. Um, usually, we we ask um, the, the the designer to explain what's coming next, um, but I missed that, so I'll do now. Um, some of you might know that already. Um, we now will transform this room into a dance floor. <laughs> and we need your help. Please put all the chairs together. Go to the bar. So keep this area free for us to work on it. And um, yeah, um, Patrick will happily sign your, your posters over there as well. And yeah, um, hope we stay um, the whole night together and dance and beer and so on. And uh, thank you, Patrick, so much. Um, we, I guess Pleasure. we all enjoyed your, Pleasure. your speech. Thank was, you. It was really, great. Thank you. thank you so much. Was that okay? Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, thousands. <laughs> Nein, die meinst du nicht. Ja, so in 15 Minuten. Also wir müssen ja um 23 Uhr 